Great. Thank you so much to you both for these fabulous talks. I think um, you really brought up some uh, fascinating issues. I, I realize I, I didn't uh, fully introduce myself at the beginning. So just so that for the spirit of this, um, for this fireside chat here, people kind of know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist by training. My, uh, my day job is I'm the senior IRB chair at Mass General Brigham, and I serve as the director of ethics for the McLean Institute for Technology and Psychiatry. So, um, so I think about a lot of these issues every day. Um, and I, I guess the, the, the first kind of maybe obvious question that jumps out to me and actually somebody from the audience kind of asked the same thing is to try to kind of combine these two talks and ideas to ask the question of basically um, because we do put so much uh, emphasis I think importantly on informed consent and then we see how you know both the promise and peril of the algorithms is essentially how do we consent people to that or do we consent people to that or you know how what what do we tell people as they and, and again my I'm always thinking about research ethics although I appreciate appreciate Dr. Grady your your highlighting kind of the, the overlapping spheres here but um, I really wonder you know what what is our responsibility to let people know about this up front um, I don't know if you both could comment on that Would you like to do you want me to go first sure <laughs> Um, I think it's a wonderful example of how both there's uncertainty about what we're learning, but also um, evolution in what we're learning. So to tell somebody, here's we're going to we're going to collect data from you in order to create an algorithm or we're going to use this algorithm on you. Uh, include your data to sort of uh, inform the algorithm or whatever. Um, it, it can't be just said as this is something we know what we're doing and, and, you know, things are changing all the time. And so it is really important, I think, to have participant engagement, ongoing engagement and community engagement about some of these issues, because otherwise we're going to lose trust. We're going to lose trust in people from people who we say we're taking your data to do this and then it ends up doing something else that and that people won't necessarily like or approve of. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I, that that's what occurred to me when I heard about all these algorithms. Good. I want to build on the trust idea uh, a bit too, which is, I think when we give somebody, say a, a chatbot, just as you use as an example, a therapy chatbot, I think we're actually uh, inadvertently uh, transferring some trust that we probably don't want to. That is, humans tend to anthropomorphize. So, and these algorithms are great at, 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 as they should at like sort of harnessing it. Like you think Siri, sometimes you think Siri doesn't like you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, you, you are, I mean, you really anthropomorphize, you know? And these algorithms, even the way they build, they have like a little image, they'll do stuff. All that anthropomorphizing is great for engagement. It's awful for trust because it means people are bringing to this algorithm a mental model of what they bring to the therapist. So they imagine a kind of sensitivity and functionality and so on from the therapist. That strikes me as a very dangerous thing to give. Um, there's this uh, uh, old notion of the uncanny valley uh, in, in images where if you make an image very close to real of a face, but not quite it, it's kind of very off-putting. I think we're actually in an, in an inadvertent uncanny valley. These, these chatbots are so human-like in some way, but they're not in other important ways. It's almost like you need big safeguards. This is not a person. It, it might tell you things, but you shouldn't take it like you would take your therapist telling you, know, that's not in the interest of people building a, a, a chatbot, but we need some other mental model for people to interact with these chatbots. And it cannot be, it's like talking to my therapist. They do not have that functionality. Uh, no matter what we might say. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense that it's almost a different role that you'd be looking at, um, which brings with it potentially different uh, role ethics. Um, the, and then I think the other kind of question that comes to my mind and also came is, is in one of the audience questions, I think is, um, it, so we, you know, we, it's not that we, are unaware of ethical issues here, right? So we, we've, we've talked about them 
I think previous two days of the talk, we uh, the conference, we've heard about them, certainly in previous years of this conference, we've heard about them. And yet, you know, here we are, and we still have um, algorithms that are behaving in ways that we wish they wouldn't and have, you know, uh, as I think um, was pointed out, our own biases kind of get baked in and, and potentially scaled. Um, so I guess the question becomes then from an, an ethics perspective, what what do we need to add? Like what is missing that somehow we're focusing on these ethical principles and it hasn't yet fixed that problem. So I guess I, I guess there's two separate questions. One is from like an ethics, and then again, my personal bias here is kind of like oversight perspective of how we're designing studies and things. But then, and then also I suppose from a technological side, I guess, so I, I guess in the short, I'm asking, you know, solutions in terms of kind of, do you have ideas about um, where we should be heading with, with this? So I can I can start. Uh, I have two 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 suggestions. I think one, um, let's call it personal ethics or professional ethics. I think that if I were a practicing psychiatrist or if I was, I think there ought to be some professional ethics around how do I decide how I want to tell a patient or a friend or anybody or endorse or be on the board of any of these algorithms. What sh should I do to act ethically vis-a-vis? Because -vis? these algorithms are not going to get. Uh, anywhere if they don't have professionals, you know, endorsing them. So I think we desperately need some fixed, I don't, I haven't, maybe, maybe in your field that's there, but I haven't seen any crisp statement of, look, here's the issues. Here's what you need to be sure of before you can endorse this algorithm. Here's what you need to be sure of before you can recommend this algorithm. Here's how you should recommend it. And that is not, I have not seen that. I think simply having that would, if I were, I'm imagining myself as a psychiatrist, that would give me a lot of clarity in my daily life and something put out at the personal level would be helpful. The other thing, which let's use the, the ugly word of R, regulation. I, I think this, especially in mental health, it absolutely needs some regulation and it needs thoughtful regulation to come in. And I think um, it, this is a place where I am a big fan of like letting things move very fast because that's what innovation is. But this is an area where we really need to kind of slow things down, put the brakes on because it has all the hallmarks of a disaster waiting to happen. It's direct to consumer. It's got, you know, a lot of, it, it is not, and, and it is not, look, self-help is one market, that's fine. People are turning to these things in moments of crises around suicidal intents. I mean, this is a really, really bad situation. So I think between taking leadership, which the people, I'm not, but you all and the people you work with are in a perfect position to do is put out some personal ethics. But I think we know enough to put out at least a, a five-year regulatory plan that says, look, this is what we need to do to, before we know the risks have been dealt with. If I, if I could just add a few friendly additions to that, um, I think um, certainly expectations for professionals about endorsing, you said endorsing algorithms and things like that, but also how to use them or how to think yeah. about using them and when to be cautious about using them, I think is a very valuable way to add to that kind of instruction for professionals. And then the other thing that I would say is in addition to professionals, I really think we need to pay attention to public education. And I mentioned participants before, I think bringing participants into the conversation and communities is really important, but there's a very, yeah. there's a lack of understanding across the public. And for us to be able as citizens to be able to understand both the promise and the peril of these things, yeah. I think we need more openness in the in the general conversation about and and it's complicated i mean some of these details are complicated for people to understand but the more we can make it accessible to the, the average person the better that's a great point i mean if we could have a few op-eds in top places that helped explain to people what can you expect from your you know a chat bot what can you not expect from it and what should you that would be super valuable you're totally right like just even as a customer like that would be amazingly useful Thank you both. Yeah, no, I think I think um, when I think about informed consent, I personally always think about that education piece, you know, in terms of like, how do you educate the individual person sitting in front of you, but also, right, if you bring up education of the entire community, that actually helps you probably have 
you know, more effective informed consent. Um, the it, one of the questions that um, came up in the in the in the Q and A here that I think is a relevant one is always just how do we engage kind of the the effective stakeholders and how do we engage the community in this? Um, I don't know if you have other ideas about that. Um, I, I like the idea of you know we need kind of I think you're right. There's not kind of professional organizations or clear regulatory you know guidance. Um, yeah. How, think, how is it normally done? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please, go ahead. How, uh, what are some examples in the past? I'm sure that, you know, like the spread of information about what therapeutic techniques work. I mean, you have a field that's gotten its ability to absorb new information and spread them and not. And how, how has, what, what are examples where it's worked well? Or um, how, has this, how has ethical principles spread? I mean, because maybe we can learn from how it's been done in the past. So, I would like Dr. Silverman to say how it's worked in psychiatry. I can say that, you know, in the in the research ethics world, the place where we've sort of learned the most about engaging the public and engaging communities is in international research. You know, that there's a lot of really great examples of places that have robust community advisory boards, but also town meetings and community forums and things like that, where they talk about research and they talk about, you know, specific kinds of research. And I think those are lessons that we don't, we haven't done as well in, in the United States as some of the places around the world that have done that. And I also think there's some differences between kinds of research. So, you know, there are certain kinds of research where that is sort of baked in already. I don't know about in psychiatry. I, I, maybe you can tell us, Dr. Silverman, is that yeah. something that people are doing? Well, I mean, I would echo, I think, what you said about other, you know, other arenas. I think we um, we do some stakeholder engagement and, and community engagement and things, but but not enough would be my general sense. You know, I think you're right. Internationally, we see we see this done very well. Um, uh, yeah, are I think there, it's something, you know, I, I mean, I, to me, one of the I mean, I guess one of the and maybe this is my own naivete in terms of um, algorithm development, but Dr. Uh, Molenathan, as you said before, kind of like what ends up happening is our own biases get incorporated right into the development. So the question would be, how do you prevent that? And my one of the probably oversimplified ways of, of trying to prevent that is by having a as diverse and large of both community engagement and participant, uh, uh, you know, and data inclusion as possible, right? I, I suspect, although that may I not think, be enough, I, I don't know. I would almost, I did definitely, I think that's, uh, let's call that table stakes. I think part of what I would wonder is, you know, it, it, it feels like before we put out drugs, we have evaluation techniques for doing that. We, we have evaluation techniques for knowing whether the final algorithm has problems, we can apply them. It, it feels like what we need is some way to say, look, if you want the Institute for Technology and Psychiatry seal of approval, whatever, like some entity that has a brand has to, like if there was an equivalent of the IOM or some entity that has a brand has to be able to go out there and say, we're going to run these algorithms through. The nice thing is you can, you have them, you can test them on a bunch of things. Right. And we have checked it for these four things or five things. And until you have gone through that, we're not going to approve you. I mean, I think we need a system like that. And we need an institution with the sort of, I mean, the government would be ideal. And, you know, um, we'll see what happens in a few weeks. But I think that, that that some actor with some gravitas needs to to put, the, put, their, put that out. I would just say I agree with that. And I also think that, you know, the, the key issue here is, is trust. It's gonna be trust yes. across the board from participants, from the public, from everybody. And the more we can build in mechanisms to show that we've thought about these things carefully and oversaw right. saw them as they right. were developing, et cetera, the more trust there will be. That, that's actually a really good angle. You're right, because that's what should make, if I was a builder of these chatbots, I'd be like, you know what? I'm gonna make sure this happens because this is in my long-term interest. Sure. Because it ensures the right ones are being built and trust means people use my product. And there's some bad ones. That, that's good. They'll get kicked out. I'll win the race. Like, I think even they should sign on board. Sign yeah. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with you both. And we don't have time to get into the details. I mean, you know, I, I will say the FDA 
has some enforcement discretion and regulates some areas of you know algorithms and softwares, medical devices. But uh, as we saw in some of those examples, you know, it's uh, things that fall outside the FDA is probably where um, where the biggest risks are. But I, I totally agree on the trust piece, and I think that you know echoes kind of what I said at the beginning about why I think this is the most important day. You know, that I think if you kind of like if you don't get the the ethics right, it really, um, you know, people's willingness to participate in research and or use these tools will be dramatically affected. Um, so I think we are at time, but I thank you both so much for your, your time and participation and all these fabulous ideas. And um, uh, yeah, thanks again. I think people can hold on and we'll be coming to the next panel shortly. Nice chatting thank you with for both inviting of you. me. Nice to meet you, Dr. Mal Nathan. Nice to meet you as well.